you just heard from Nigel is a prophetic word from God. It's God breaking into our lives and our narrow horizon, narrow perspective, and little worlds. It's God breaking through into it in a, with a prophetic word. And as, as Andrew was beginning to, to, to expand this morning, before Nigel stood and shared that with us, thank you, Nigel, for that. Thank you, God, for giving him that. What I want to say to you is that in this room right now are more prophets. Or if I can put it this way, more people who have a prophetic gift. Okay? And in this room right now, there will be some apostles. I'm going to say something about apostles briefly, personal way later. There will be some apostles. People who cut back the undergrowth to go out into dark and strange and weird places to plant churches and bring the kingdom of God. Apostles, ones who are sent. In this room also, right now, will be people who are evangelists. Ones who bring the good news of Jesus Christ into places where it hasn't been heard yet. Bring, bring us a good news. Some of you are evangelists. In this room right now, there will also be teachers. And I, some of you might be school teachers or university teachers or teachers at home, but in a very specific way, teachers of the Bible, teachers of the Word of God, teachers of Scripture. Some of you will be gifted in that way. And some of you also here in this room right now will be pastors. If that's true, that some of us are apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, those fivefold ministries, if that's true, that means there's enough DNA in this room right now to turn to spread the gospel across the whole world into every place that's never been before. <coughs> we have in our midst right now everything that needs from God to do that. Some of you will be thinking, well, it's not me. Martin's paid to do this stuff for us all. Or I'm, you know, I'm not really into that kind of thing. You, you guys do it for me and I'll come to church and enjoy the service. Thank you very much. But no, that isn't true. Every single one of you, whether you know it or not, whether you've discovered it or not, are either an apostle, an evangelist, a prophet, a teacher, or a pastor. And I want to unfold that in, 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 this morning with you. And this teaching comes not from me, but from Ephesians 4. Look it up if you like. Because the context in which it comes is really important. Ephesians chapter 4. It's about page 1111. Something like that. 1110, this is in my Bible. Is that right? 1175. 1175, thank you, Nigel. Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to read in a minute from verse 11. Ephesians 4, chapter 11, chapters 4 and verse 11. So notice where this comes from, these giftings. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So the gift that you have, the anointing that you have to be one of those five things, yeah, comes not from me, 
comes from, or anybody else or the bishop or whatever, it comes from Christ himself. There's no hint that it's only for special people or people to get paid or whatever. This is absolutely clear that it's for the whole body of Christ and for the whole body of Christ, that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, if you look at verse 14, he puts it against the dark shadow side of this whole thing. Then, when we uh, uh, actually live this out, discovered this, and have bodied it out in our midst, yeah, when we bodied this fivefold ministry forth, then, verse 14, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Read between the lines of what's going on here. Clearly the writer is addressing churches where there is deceitful scheming going on and, and, and cunning and craftiness. And he's saying the answer to this is the fivefold ministry. Yeah? Okay. And then verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part, as every one of us, each part does its work. That's the vision of the New Testament church. That's what we're learning to do here. That's what it's all about. So the goal of the fivefold ministry is unity, maturity, and the fullness of Christ. And we're trying to get away from immaturity, being tossed around like boats on a sea, and getting away from any kind of cunning craftiness or deceitful scheming. We're heading towards love, unity, and the fullness of the body of Christ. Okay? If any one of these gifts is missing in the life of the church, for, probably because it hasn't been identified and lifted up and honoured, then we're actually lame. We can't make progress forwards. We go backwards. We need all of these five gifts. Now, where do these gifts come from? Have a look at uh, 1 Corinthians 12. If you've got a moment to find that. Back a few pages. 1 Corinthians 12. Okay. And verses 4 to 6. These are the, the core passages that we're going to draw on this morning. You can go and go into them deeper at home. But there's 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Yeah? Yeah? So if one person has a prophetic gift, and you have a gift of being a pastor, it's coming from the same source. It's coming from God. So there's no reason for rivalry or jealousy or anything like that. When you hit see spot somebody else's gift, rejoice. Because it's coming from the same God that you worship. The same Jesus who died for you both. Yeah? Okay. And... Who gets what gift? Have a look at the same chapter, but chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians, verse 11 now. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit, as, as he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Yeah? I'm not going to tell you what you are. The Spirit tells you what your gift is and how to respond. It's the Spirit, the same Spirit, who... Uh, anoints each one of us to do what God uniquely is equipping us to do for the sake of the whole, yeah? Now have a look at um, what the same chapter and verses 29 and 30, yeah? The last two verses of that, chapter 12. And Paul asks this question. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts in, of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? 
And the obvious answer to those rhetorical questions is no. Thank God not everybody doesn't, has them all. Uh, there is no, mono no one person who has a monopoly on these things, okay, or any of them. And it's not as though you've got like one group of peace people who are all prophets, and you go down the road to another church and they're all uh, pastors or something, right? No, God has set every church up so that in every church you have each one of these five. Okay, the list isn't complete, but in Ephesians it's clearly fivefold ministry. Okay. To so say, in this room <coughs> right here and now, all these giftings are present but probably latent, waiting to be discovered and realized and set forth in many of us. When you discover your gifting, it's like suddenly realizing that you've got a wind behind your sail and you're being, almost in spite of yourself, being carried forward in that gifting. And I think that's one of the ways we discover what our gift is. There can be a bit of trial and error in it. Um, but when you when you've discovered what it is, all of a sudden you've got lift off, and the wind in your sails carries you forward, blows you forward, almost in spite of yourself, right? Um, for many years, I thought I really had, as an Anglican vicar, that the church was paying me to do this job. I jolly well ought to be a good teacher pastor, right? And the whole system, from right from you know, <coughs> right from the early centuries, is geared up to the paid ministers of the church being teacher pastors, looking after the flock of the settled people who come to church. Right? Uh, for years, I thought well, you know, uh, that's what I have to be. I've got to try and do this and learn how to do this. And I used to go around watching other people at Theological College and watching other ministers. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. One of those. I can't do it, Lord. I'm really not very good at it. Sorry. And I went away for, uh, went for years. I felt really um, like I was failing and just kind of getting wrong. I mean, all, all the books you could possibly read, go into all the courses about how to be a good pastor, knew all the theory, but really wasn't very good at it. Actually quite bad at it, even when I tried. <laughs> Did my best. Until the day that I got into this fivefold ministry thing in Ephesians, uh, in a particular way, and discovered what my gifting was. My gifting is to be an apostle. I have an apostolic ministry. I love to go out into strange, weird, dark places, learn funny foreign languages from marginalised Eastern Europeans, and get alongside them and try and help them. And I just feel that massive wind in my sails when I do this. And there's a whole church down the road now that started because of this. And it's, it's been, in a sense, easy because I felt this wind behind me. I discovered my gifting. I still have to try and be a reasonably good part teacher pastor. You can tell me how my what my teaching is like later. But I have to do as well as I can in it. I can't be rubbish at it completely. I have to take it seriously. But in identifying that my particular gifting is apostolic, I'm released from... <coughs> to do that, but actually within myself, released from guilt. I don't have to beat myself up anymore. You can if you like, but <laughs> I'm not going to. Because you see, and this is the obvious thing, because it means in this room right here and now, there are teachers and there are pastors. Many of them we know who they are. So you could do that bit a bit better than me, so get on with it, see? And some of you are not terribly good evangelists. I very heavy and make make the good news sound rather like very difficult heavy <coughs> news. I really do. But when I meet somebody who's gifted to be an evangelist, it's so fantastic. They just sit down with people and they're joyful and lightweight, and um, and they the, the people listen and they, wow, yeah, that's so cool. See, and um, prophetic. 
There are some among, we're going to get into prophecy now. There are some people in the room now who definitely have a prophetic gift. And, and when Nigel stood up and said that, wow, that's heaven breaking in. How narrow-minded I am. I don't think of enough about the suffering Christians around the world. I need a Nigel to speak to me about that, to broaden my horizons, open my eyes, quicken my compassion, and hear what God is saying through this man to me. Do you see? And others have prophetic gifts in our midst as well. Okay. Are, we, are you with me? Now, I want to stay a bit longer with this, with pro prophecy in particular. Okay. Because prophecy is one of the five. We know from experience and from Isaiah 55 that our thoughts are not God's thoughts. Yeah? They're not our thoughts. He's, what he's thinking about is different from what we're thinking about most of the time. So how do we hear God's thoughts? We hear God's thoughts by prophetic words that come to us through those who have prophetic gifts. Yeah? It's amazing. Something from heaven breaks through into this broken and hurting world. Something precious. Sometimes, this is all because the scripture is rich with prophetic words. People, in those days only men, <laughs> thank God it's opened out. But in those, the men who were anointed by the Spirit to bring the thoughts of God to earth. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Prophetic word through the psalmist. We needed to hear that. That's how... That's what God's heart is, abounding in steadfast love. Someone on earth, some man had to hear that so that we could hear it too, yeah? Sometimes it's about hope. Isaiah 45, I'll just look that up. Don't feel you have to look it up now. <coughs> hope in the midst of despair. Here are the Jews in exile, verses uh, 11 to 13 of, verse, of uh, chapter 45. <coughs> This is what the Lord says. Now notice this is the Lord speaking. It's Isaiah writing it down. But the Lord says, first person singular, the Holy One of Israel and its maker concerning the things to come, do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth and created human beings on it. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled their starry hosts. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. And I will make all his ways straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or a reward, says the Lord Almighty. A prophetic word, the thoughts of God coming to heaven through this man, this prophet Isaiah, to a people who had all but lost hope altogether. Something's going to happen. God is going to set you free through a pagan king called Cyrus, in fact. God speaking hope. Look on to chapter 58. Fasten your safety belt. Sometimes the thoughts of man are different to the thoughts of God, and we need to be given a jolly good kick up the bum. Okay? They're all going through their religious practice here, fasting, doing this religious stuff, but they've lost the plot. So here comes God, speaks to his prophet Isaiah, tells them what it's really about. Let's just look at verse 3 here. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please, and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife, and in striking each other, with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Sorry, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? So he goes on. Is, is verse 6 now, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide poor, 
provide the poor wanderer with shelter, and when you see the naked to clothe them, and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. So it goes on. Do you see what God's doing here? This is a big telling off. The true fast is about the things he's disclosed. They needed to hear that, as this morning we needed to hear the word of the Lord through Nigel. Prophetic words. In the Old Testament dispensation, that period of many centuries, there were kings for a large part of that history, and the kings who governed the whole religious and economic and national life had prophets alongside them. They were like thorns in the flesh much of the time. The king wanted to have total control, but God wouldn't have it. So he appointed prophets to bring the thoughts of God to bear on the kings of the day who were always in danger of going their own way, as, of course, famously happened with King David when he had an affair with Bathsheba, and it took Prophet Nathan to come along and say, tell him a parable, set a kind of trap for him, and then said, uh, actually get him to see that he had sinned. Not only by pinching another man's wife, but also by having that husband or that wife killed on the battlefield. And it took that prophet, Nathan, to point this out to mighty King David. So kings needed their prophets. And our PCC and our religious equip our religious system, our the, the, the structures that we have in place in the Anglican Church need prophetic voices. We need prophetic voices that will wake us up and shake us up and speak into our complacency and challenge our power structures. So a creative tension, do you see, between a necessary structure but also the need to have the voice from beyond that just comes in and breaks in to the status quo. And that's what we need. Now, just something on discernment. How do we know? How do we know when it's God who's been speaking? This is a really important question. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 14. We, were, we have been earlier in 1 Corinthians 12, and I'm just taking it on now to 1 Corinthians 14. And verse 29. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29. Two or three prophets should speak, this is in the lighting, worshipping life of the church, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. So what is prophetically spoken has to be weighed by the others in the church. And then he says very interestingly in verse 32 have I got this right? Yes. Verse 32 the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. So it's as though it takes a prophetic gift to discern somebody else's prophetic gift. Mm. Almost a kind of a house of prophets. <laughs> well, where, where gifts will be um, <coughs> the, 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 Prophetic words will be weighed in the balance to see whether they come from, if you like, the flesh or from God, where they've come from. Anybody can miss here and get it wrong. Okay. So, some yawning going on. Maybe teaching's not my gift after all. <laughs> anyway, I'm doing my best. Stay with me. <laughs> um, so how do we then know what is of God? Well, the person who was bringing the prophetic word will be somebody who's willing to submit to the authority of the church. Nathan, the prophet Nathan, was submitted to the authority of King David, although he put him in his place. 
the prophet, the true person with prophetic word, will be willing to submit to the authority of the church. It won't be just a loose cannon. They're difficult people to have around prophets because they prick you with like a thorn in the flesh and say, wake up, you need to hear this, you're forgetting this. So the temptation is just, we don't want that person, you need to get rid of that person. They can go to another church where they do that sort of thing. But no, 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 we need to say no, we need our prophets because we need to hear the words and thoughts of God breaking into our structures. Okay? The person with the prophetic word then will be willing to be accountable to the authorities that are in place. They will need to have, they will have, the true prophet will have a measure of humility. In other words, the willingness to say, well, maybe I did mishear that, or I'm not sure whether this is the right moment to bring this, but I bring it anyway. And a sense of, uh, this is not me speaking, I'm just trying to hear what God, I think God is saying. So humility must be a very important quality in this. If you're saying, God is thinking this, <laughs> the danger of pride is colossal, isn't it, really? <laughs> so the person with the prophetic word needs to be, needs to be very humble. And, and Paul is so brilliant in this stuff. He really is fantastic. Because sandwiched between the chapters 12, all about the gifts of the Spirit, and chapter 14, when he gets particularly into tongues and prophecy, but sandwiched between 12 and 14, what have we got? 1 Corinthians 13. What a masterpiece. This whole chapter given over to the one single message, the, the, the one single litmus test of love, agape love. And then if you look there at verse 2 with respect to uh, prophecy, if I have the <coughs> gift of prophecy... And can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains and do not have love, I am nothing. If we have to reduce everything down to one verse, that might be it. <laughs> That's the ultimate test, isn't it? Now, we have to be really careful here because... In, in English culture, love is um, a word we sort of use rather freely and liberally. And we tend to think of it in a rather sort of warm and cosy way, mm. very polite English way. Um, yeah. But actually, the word, the prophetic word, in love, may come and be rejected radically. If you think of Jeremiah, I won't look it up now, if you think of Jeremiah, there he is, around him are all these other prophets, Hananiah the key one, all these other prophets saying, oh, peace, peace, all is well, my dears, don't let your hearts be troubled, all is well, don't worry about those Babylonians over the hillside, it's all going to be fine. Jeremiah says, no, the word of the Lord is this, those Babylonians are going to come, and when they come, you need to submit to them, because they've been sent by God, although they have strange gods, they've actually been sent by God to discipline you, take you out into exile into a strange land for 70 years, you need to submit to that, because to not submit to that, not be willing to be captive to the Babylonian enemy is to stand in the face of God and resist him. <coughs> so you can imagine how tempting it would have been for all those Jewish people living in Jerusalem, Judea at that time, to, to uh, 6th century BC, to be saying, um, we prefer Han Hananiah's message, it's much nicer, all is well. Jeremiah said what he was believed in his heart. Now, how did they know at the time who was right? How could they measure it? Who's to say which is the true prophet? And actually, at that point, we have to say sometimes, well, 
maybe we can't be absolutely certain, but it will become clear. It will become clear. And with hindsight, we'll be able to say, and that's what happened as this was stuff was written up, with hindsight, oh, Jeremiah was right. The Babylonians did come, and they did take all our leaders out in, in, and put them in captivity. Yeah, and we did hang up our harps on uh, on the trees in Ju in Jewish, uh, Babylon, as the, down by the waters, where, as the, as the psalm says, all of that happened, and we were carted out. But there, we discovered the hand of the Lord, who pointed out powerfully how we'd gone wrong for so many centuries, and put a new spirit in us, turned our hearts of stone to hearts of flesh, and we were brought back into our land and they can look back then and say oh Jeremiah got it right we may have thrown him in the system but actually he was the true prophet so love can express itself in a very very unpopular and powerful way I just want to finish by saying start where I started off. It's really important. This is really important. And we've now, thanks largely to Andrew, who broke this open for us, I think, about last May, we now have a style of worship where you really can respond to your gift if you have a prophetic gift. You really can do what Nigel did earlier. You really have total permission to do that. Not just permission, but actually... Actually, if you feel God has laid something on your heart and you don't bring it, yes, you don't bring your, the prophetic word, you're holding us all back in immaturity. Do you see? That's very clear from the teaching, isn't it? So I want to say to you, if you're feeling, I really feel God is saying this to me, but I haven't quite got the nerve to go up there and I might have heard it wrong and it is a bit of a dramatic thing I'm going to say, um, have courage. It could be God speaking through you to us all, helping us to grow up into maturity. Do you want to run with that, Andrew? No? Take that forward? Amen.